Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. Marshall. How well are you plugged into your world? I don't mean the world around you, outside of you. I mean your own private world, the one inside of you. Most men and women are content enough to take themselves as they find themselves, but some, either running from the world outside or searching for the one within, seek new frontiers, far more dangerous than even the boundaries of space. More exotic than the mysteries of the ancient East. If your wife has turned to someone else, why not do the same, George? Not really, Serena. What does that mean? It means if she has, then first I must kill them both. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Death Wish was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Ralph Bell. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It was Satchel Paige, the ageless baseball pitcher, who said, Never look back. Somebody might be gaining on you. That's a pretty apt description of almost any of us these days. Life is a perpetual train we are running to catch. A race just to stay ahead of the bill collector. A mad dash to accumulate enough of the world's goods to buy security, which dances farther and farther away. George Solway is so little different from any of us that it would not be unfair to say that he could be you or me. Tickets, please. Come on, commuters, Andy, up. <laughs> oh, hello, Mr. Solway. Hi, Connie. How's it going? Oh, back and forth. <laughs> How's it with you? You know how it is with us brokers, up and down. Today down. You know the market? No, me, I'm pooped. Beat. About to ankle back with bar car and get me a little restorative. Yeah, you gotta watch that stuff, Mr. Solway. Could get to you. Well, I hope it does before I fizz off like a rocket through the ceiling. Hey, something wrong? <laughs> the process of coping with everyday living. It's getting on my nerves. Uh, I know what you mean. I wonder if you do, Connie. I hope you don't. Ah, forget it. I'm just knocked out like my fellow passenger here. <laughs> I almost forgot uh, here's his ticket. He asked me to give it to you so you wouldn't be disturbed. Oh, he looks dead to it. I uh, better check him before we get to his station. Oh, don't worry, Connie. He gets off before me, Denton. I'll see he doesn't miss it. Well, you might cork off yourself. Forget it. I wound up like a spring these days. The last thing I can do is sleep. Anywhere. It's been building slowly. I can't say I haven't been conscious of it. But I try to put it out of my mind. It's nothing special. Just the way I live. Trade on the market floor all day. Hit the commute home. Try to be a husband and a father. Commute back. All the time inside is like a pressure cooking without any safety valve. I gotta do something. But what? I also gotta live. And this is the only way I know how to. When I got back with my double martini, my companion was awake. Excuse, please. I wish to thank you so much. For what? For protecting my meditation. With your pleasure, my name is Ranjit Rabinatakor. It was most kind of you to tender my ticket. That's my pleasure. 
I have the habit, you see, to have some meditation by this time of day. I am on the date train, so it was important to me I remain undisturbed. Okay, by me. I thought you'd gone to sleep. Oh, no, 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 no. So far from that. My mind is totally awake. I hear all you and the conductor say, but I do not have to break my concentration. At the same time, I am at rest, huh? You mean you could meditate and hear us at the same time? Oh, yes. But, uh, what good is it then? I hope the most good. Such peace, such relaxation, such rest for the soul. In rhapsodic meditation, I am in perfect balance. I can put away all care, get away from all pressures, step back far enough to see them for what they are. Hmm? Rhapsodic meditation? What is that? One of those new religions? Uh, no religion at all, my dear man. Pure common sense. Yeah, sure. What <clears throat> What works for you doesn't necessarily work for me, though. I have never suggested it, Mike. I only answered your questions. Oh, sure. But, uh, you'll excuse me if I stick to the old fruit of the vine to get me back off the ceiling? Uh, to each his own, as long as it works. But I think one is a negative approach. And the other, a positive. Uh, may I give you my card? Sure, but what for? Are you interested in the market? I am interested in many things, of course. But at the moment, only you. Me? Why? Because I think you are looking for help. And in RM, you might find it. Your attention, ladies and gentlemen. The next stop will be Denton. Uh, uh, pardon me, please. Uh, this is where I must get off. Strange character. And yet I'd give a lot to be as calm as he seemed to be. Crazy. All this meditation stuff. It would never do for me. Besides, a martini had me all relaxed, so I was ready to go home and face Mary. And maybe just for once, not fly off the handle. Hi, Mary. I'm home. Hi, George. How was your day? Oh, you know, cat on a hot tin roof. You? The hours passed eventually. How about a drink? Honey, you get the late train. Dinner's all ready. I thought we might skip it tonight. You mean you thought I might? Well, it wouldn't do you any harm. Well, that's what you think. So I'll take it myself. You gonna join me? No. What does that mean? You gonna fight me? If I fight, darling, it's only for us. Please, eat dinner instead of drinking it. Hey, what is this? You're going to exhume the temperance union? But you're so thin, dear. You need proper nourishment. I'm worried. Desperately worried, that's all. About what? You. You're driving yourself right over the brink. You're so hyped up, you're making yourself a nervous wreck. You talk as though I was sick. Well, in a way, you are, dearest. Even your doctor says you're hypertense. So, that's the nature of the beast. What can I do about it? Well, there is something you can do about it. If you'd only try. What? Look, may maybe I will join you in one drink so we can talk about it. Oh, a, a weak one, please. One week, Martini, coming up. What do you have in mind? Well, let, let, let's sit a minute. Oh, thank you, darling. <laughs> to us. Sure. Oh, well, this is better. I, um... I was talking to Marge Finley today. What's she looking for? More contributions? No, nothing like that. We, we were talking about traveling. Traveling? George, she and Bill are just like us. Except they're taking advantage of their freedom. Six months ago, they had that delirious Caribbean cruise. Now, next week, they're off for another whole month in the Pacific. Well, that's all very well for Bill. If he can afford it, I just don't see where he finds the time. Same place you could find. I can't get away from the street, Mary. You're not a customer's man. Nobody depends on you. You have no plan. My employers depend on me to make trades for them. Look, Glastonbury and Pepper have plenty of others to fill your shoes. And they don't mind taking vacations. Lord knows you filled in for enough of them. It's different for them. We have the children to worry about. Oh, what children? Tom and Alex are both off at college. Yes, but Debbie... Debbie is in boarding she school. She comes home weekends and vacations. Well, not many weekends. George, 
George, you're killing yourself at this pace. You've just got to slow down. What do you want me to do? You're a workaholic. I think you've driven yourself till you're ready to snap any moment. I I'm trying to save you from that. Don't you understand? You've got to see a doctor. I've seen a doctor. What does he have to tell me that I don't know? Well, it, it isn't a medical doctor you need. Oh, so that's what all this is working up to, huh? You think I flipped out, huh? That's what you think of me. I didn't say that. But it's what you thought. Now, don't lie to me. George, you're hurting me. What do you think you're doing to me? Oh. George? George, where are you going? I don't know. Patty will walk anywhere just so I can find a little peace. Every nerve in my body was singing. Every vein and artery hammering. I could feel my heart pounding rapidly as if it were rising in my chest, pushing up against my throat so that it was hard to breathe. I had to do something, but I wasn't ready for some jerk to pick my brains or rummage around in my psyche. Not yet. There must be some other way. And then I remembered the little Indian gentleman on the train. I fumbled in my pocket for his card and found it. I'd give him one try. Mr. Uh, Rabina Tagore? You may call me a Maharishi. Maharishi? That's your name, too? Let us say my title. What does it mean? Oh, teacher will be good enough. Is that what you do? Teach this uh, rhapsodic meditation? I teach that and the way. Well, is there, uh, is there some way you could... Teach me how to use it? Oh, but of course. Is it... Is it expensive? Well, that would be up to you. To join the society is a fee of $200 to those who can afford. I think you can. Uh, to be frank, in many ways, I think you cannot afford not to, Mr. Solway. You know me? You know my name? Oh, yes, Mr. Solway. I have been expecting your call. <laughs> seemed that the Maharishi operated out of his house in Denton, so I had to make an appointment for late Friday afternoon. I felt better making it. At least I'd taken some step to relieve my tensions. But I'd reckoned without Mary, who had the same object in view. Hi, Mary, it's me. George, um, we're out on the patio. We? I'll be right there. I didn't expect you home so soon, George. I have an appointment in Denton. I want to pick up the car so I can drive back. Uh, I uh, hope I'm not butting in. I didn't know you were expecting company. Well, I, I wasn't. I mean, well, look who just dropped in. Uh, this is Phil Egan. Oh, I don't believe I've had the pleasure. Well, you haven't met. But heavens knows you've heard me talk about him enough. Uh, Phil and I went to high school together. <laughs> Not the same class. I think I was two grades ahead. How do you do, Mr. Solway? How are you? Uh, would you like to join us for a drink, darling? No, thanks. I've got to be on my way to my appointment. Uh, don't uh, let me break up the party. No party. Your wife and I were just renewing old acquaintance. Yeah, so I see. Don't let me... Uh... Stand in the way. I have to bow out anyway. Oh, George, you, you don't understand. I, he's it? your guest, yes. You take care of him. I have my own problems. What? what? Where, where are you going? Oh, that's my secret. It's only fair, isn't it, since you seem to have some of your own? I'll be back for dinner. There is going to be dinner. Of course. The last thing I needed was to meet the man that Mary might have married. Would have until she met me, Philip Egan. Meeting him at last, I had only one blind desire to kill him, wipe him out forever. But I never imagined then that that was exactly what I had condemned myself to do. The Eternal Triangle, one of life's most terrifying cliches. But Stop a minute. Do we know that this one is a cliché? 
Or are there angles within angles that may change the shape of things to come? Can rhapsodic meditation bring George Solway a peace that may not pass it understanding, but at least may bring understanding itself? Or will it start him on a voyage within himself that will lead him to a whirlpool of disaster? I shall return shortly with Act Two. What we're concerned with here is a product of our times. A man pushed by the circumstances of his lifestyle to the end of his control. A man afflicted by one of the most prevalent diseases of our century. The silent killer. Hypertension. Not the least of this condition's results is that it not always only kills, but may develop into something far worse. A situation where the victim not only punishes himself, but becomes psychotic enough to blame his agony on others and seeks their deaths rather than his to achieve redemption. I was stunned at the size of the little man's property. The Maharishi owned an estate. A servant in a tucked up sari that looked like a loose diaper showed me into a small anteroom with a high ceiling. I waited there for a long while with some sort of bells chiming steadily deep in the house and the room heavy with incense. I was more than half asleep when the Maharishi came. Not in Western clothes now, but in a long flowing robe which made him seem taller and more impressive. Greetings, my friend, Mr. Solway. Pretty impressive place you have here. And not me, Mr. Solway. All of us who study the way belong to it, not it to us. Wait a minute. Maybe I'm getting it over my head here. All I want to do is to try this meditation thing. Why not? There are no strings attached. (laughs) But we've got uh, kind of a whole thing going here. I mean, uh, like a religion. If we want to progress beyond the meditation, that is your election. No one will patronize you to do so. Only three things are asked. What? That you pay the initiation fee which you have, that you promise to try to use this gift for what it is, and never try to make it something it is not, and that you keep the word of the mantra we give you a secret known only to yourself. Well, sure. I agree. But do you think this will work for me? That is a question only you yourself can answer. Come, let us see what it means for you. It was a room shrouded in darkness, with flowers all around, and a scent of incense everywhere. He told me to remove my shoes, sat me in an ordinary chair, told me to close my eyes, and murmured the rhythmic syllables of the mantra quietly in my ear. I remained repeating them in my mind. And for 15 minutes, even though I was partly conscious of other sounds, a passing plane, a voice someplace in the house, a door closing, I sank through layers and then floated to the top of some lulling sea. And for the first time since I could remember in years, I knew peace. Meditation. Okay, okay. I just want you to ride on up to Middleton. It happened to me last week and was my old woman sore at me by the time I got back. I was meditating. You can lose everything while you're in meditation. There are no thoughts. Just a soft blank. A warm nothingness. A blanket. It's a forgetfulness. You can't talk to Max Berger. He has to put down everything he hears. That's why he's not well liked. Still, it's difficult to talk about R.M. to anyone. Even my wife. More coffee, George? Oh, this'll do. 
so was train time. Oh, George, if you would just talk to this psychiatrist once. I don't need a psychiatrist. I have R.M. I've been going to him. He's wonderful. You'd be better off with meditation. It's a heck of a lot cheaper. Look, we don't have to worry about money, George. Which is exactly why I want you to stay out of the clutches of some head shrink. That is a terrible thing to say. If you knew how much this man has put himself out to help us without asking anything in return. Oh, to help you, maybe. Is that it, Mary? You're just tired of me and looking for something better? That's the last thing you should ever say to me, George. Well, how could I blame you? After all, I'm such a terrible grouch, impossible to live with. Already halfway around the bend... Oh, for heaven's sake, let's stop arguing. I have a train to catch. Driving to the station, parking the car, my nerves were exploding in small bursts all over my body like electrical charges. I thought, what if Mary was unfaithful to me? And then the corollary, perhaps she already is. And I knew I needed meditation more than ever. I could hardly wait for the train to start rolling. So tell me, George, how were the dreams last night? Getting better all the time? I don't dream, Max. At least I try not to. It's nightmare time. Yeah, I know what you mean. The way things go sometimes, there's just no escape. Well, I found one. Huh? Oh, you mean that uh, meditation gimmick? Hey, how is that? You meet any uh, luscious dames while you're daydreaming? No. That's not the object, and it isn't daydreaming. Well, whatever it is. No day? No. Well, you can bet if I went in for it, that's what would tease me into suspended animation. Oh, knock it off, will you, Max? Oh, pardon me. You take this thing seriously. Yes, I do. So what do you get out of it? Peace. Relaxation. I sat back, letting my hands fall on my knees. I started the rhythmic cadence of my mantra running through my head. Although I could still hear the rattle of the train, it had ceased to be part of my consciousness. I was in a warm, encircling sea, spinning gently but insistently to the vortex in the center. I was content. There was no fear. And then the voice was calling Who are you? I am Serena. I'm waiting for you. Where? Beyond the edge. The edge of what? The edge that separates your world from mine. How can I cross it? Should I want to? Because only then will you know an end to torment and the final peace. Why did she look so hauntingly familiar? Why did she draw me so strongly? And why did I feel, in spite of almost overwhelming desire, that I must resist her? That she meant danger and disaster for me. Your attention, please. We are coming into Central Station. Last stop. Please check for any belongings before you leave this train. Hey, meditator. Hey, 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 hey. Better come on back and join the common folks. Are we in already? Just about. And don't tell me you've been meditating for a whole hour. I must have fallen asleep. Yeah, sure. And from the look of you, you must have had some dream. Oh, that must have been some gorgeous babe. Oh, come on, Max. Lay off with you. Oh, man, you must have a guilty conscience. It's not me who should have the guilty conscience. Now, what is that? Mean? Oh, forget it, will you? The train's in. I want to get off. All through the business day, I couldn't forget it. What had I meant by that remark? Once during the morning, I called Mary, and twice in the afternoon. But she wasn't home. But it wasn't until after an unsuccessful meditation on the train going home that I finally faced the truth. I couldn't wait to face Mary with it. Where were you all day, Mary? I went shopping in the morning. 
Had lunch with some of the girls. Had my session with a psychiatrist in the afternoon. Why? I was trying to reach you all day. I'm sorry, George. Anything important? That depends on the point of view. Mary? Hmm? Are you having an affair? An affair? <laughs> with whom? The psychiatrist, whatever his name is. Are you out of your mind, George? Strange question for you to ask. I thought you decided I was. But you haven't answered my question. I won't dignify it by giving it one. Which means you are. Which means nothing of the sort. You're lying. I am not lying. Oh, really, George, this is the last straw. If you don't do something to pull yourself together again, either I'm going to have to leave you or, or maybe I will have that affair. You better not. I wouldn't think you'd care much anymore. I care this much. If I catch you even so much as looking at another man, I'll kill you and him. Oh, don't be ridiculous. I mean it. I believe you do. Don't you see how sick you are? I am not sick. Can you look at you? The veins standing out in your throat, you're shaking all over. Even if you're not sick, then you must be feeling guilty about something. What is it, George? Is it you that's having the affair? Me? Me? You know, I've never even so much as looked at another woman. The thought has never entered my mind. What is it, darling? What is it that's driving you, pulling you apart, destroying you on me? <laughs> I had to admit Mary was right. I was shaking. I could feel myself coming apart at the seams. And she was right about something else. I hadn't told her the whole truth. All day long, I had been thinking about another woman. The woman in my meditation. Serena. The woman every instinct told me I must resist. And yet whose spell still lay on me, drawing me irresistibly back to her. I couldn't wait to return to my meditation the next morning. You came back, George. Yes, Serena. I knew you would. Are you coming to me this time? How can I? It's so easy. Just cut your ties with your world and step into mine. I don't know how to... see myself sitting, eyes closed, on the 837, on my way into the city. That's me, George Solway. That's my body. at the woman. She is blindingly beautiful. So beautiful I can't separate her features. Only the overall loveliness and the radiance of calm and promise that makes me long to go to her arms. But another force drags my glance back to the figure sitting so still and unmoving on the swaying train seat. I'm cold suddenly and afraid First time in my life, I understand what is meant by the death wish. What a terrifying thing it is to invade the privacy of a man's mind, to watch him struggle between illusion and reality. The sense of decency prompts us to walk away, and yet, how can we deny the fascination of a struggle unresolved? Won't you join me to discover how it is when I return with Act Three? Now, shall we return again to the haunted chambers of George Solway's mind 
as he rides in suspended animation on his morning commuter train, he hangs in a half-world between the bright promise of illusion and the black, stark reality of his crumbling personal life. Which way should he reach? For the blessed anodyne of total nothingness and a shadowy world of release from pain, or the old world, which has become as agonizing as the tortures of the rack? Let us find out. I'm afraid, Serena. There's nothing to be afraid of. Come, George. Now. Before it's too late. Too late for what? To take me in your arms. Hold me. Possess me. Make me your own. I can't, Serena. I have a wife. I know. I can't leave her. Why not? She doesn't love you anymore. No. The way I've been lately, I could hardly blame her if she's turned to someone. And how is she? I don't know. I'm afraid. I think she has. What's so for the good is so for the gander. If she has, why don't you do the same? No, not first. It means that Mary has, and I find out. First, I'd kill them both. If you did that, then you wouldn't be able to return to me. Why? There would no longer be room for you in my world. It's now or never for me. I guess it has. It has to be never. Wait! She was gone. I took some steps after her, but she was swallowed in the mist. Quickly, shakily, I stumbled back to where my body lay like a wax doll on the train seat. In sudden weakness, I reached for the armor of its protection, collapsing into it and coming awake with a roaring in my head dry and burning. It was an endless day of the exchange. By the closing bell, my head was one solid, dull ache. I couldn't wait to get to the train and go back into meditation. It was strange. I dropped quickly away into nothingness, but as soon as I reached that plane, I found myself leaving my body easily and quickly. I roamed endlessly, free of the shackles of my aching head and twitching nerves. There was no time. It could have been a week, a day, an eternity. It was a shock to get home and find no Mary waiting for me. A shock that turned quickly into a nail-biting fury that drove me straight to the bar. I didn't mean to be late like this. Where have you been? Out. Nowhere. Just driving. What train did you catch? At four o'clock. Oh. I wasn't expecting you back till the 4.50 at the earliest. Yes, I'll bet. I don't like your tone. And I don't like your lies. What lies? Who do you think you're kidding? Just driving around. If you were, who with? Myself. You expect me to believe that? Who do you think I was with? The guy. What guy? The guy, the one you're having an affair with. You are impossible. I can't take it anymore. If you have to know where I was, I'll tell you. I was with Ruth Harris. Oh? Ruth Harris. She's a travel agent. I was talking with her about going away for a couple of weeks so I could get hold of myself. And maybe you could do the same. Your dinner's on the stove. You can heat it yourself. I'll leave breakfast in the morning. Where are you going? Upstairs to get my stuff and move it into the guest room. I have had all I can take. I had a lousy night. Couldn't sleep. By morning, I was ready to break down the door of the guest room. Then I had a better idea. I clumped downstairs to a noisy breakfast, which I didn't eat and left for the station by car at my usual time. 
But I didn't go to the station. I parked at the nearest shopping mall and walked back to the house. I found a place in the shrubbery where I could watch the front door and settle down to wait. It was nearly 11 o'clock that he came, getting out of his car and going up bold as brass to ring the front doorbell. The man I'd surprised Mary with less than a week before. Something Egan. Oh, yeah. Philip. That was it. Oh, Phil, it's you. I've been frantic waiting. I came as soon as I could. Oh, you don't know how wonderful it is to see you. All right, Mary, take it easy. I, I can't anymore. This thing has got to be settled, Phil. I can't live with it anymore. Mary. What? Look at me, dear. Now, simmer down. We'll find a way to settle it. Let's uh, go inside now, shall we? I'd seen it. I'd seen the proof. But for a moment, I couldn't believe it. I was being driven to murder. But coldly... I decided I had no intention of paying the price for it. I didn't have to. The just punishment for their treachery to me could be meted out while I was miles away from the scene and securely alibied. I turned and headed for the railroad station. Please. Hello, Mr. Sorby. You are taking a very late train, I see. Oh, Maharishi. Yes, I, I had some business that detained me at home. <laughs> I have some that takes me from mine. Uh, may I join you? Well, yeah, sure, why not? Uh, thank you so much. Tell me, are you meditating regularly? I sure am. Has it brought you relaxation? Yeah, in its own way. Oh, uh, would you excuse me? I uh, usually meditate on the train. Oh, but of course. I have still my morning paper to read. had in mind, that couldn't suit me better. An eyewitness. My presence on a train miles away from my house, established as an unshakable alibi, and an opportunity to prove the incontrovertibility, whether or not my wife was cheating on me, before I killed her and her lover. With no effort, I stepped away from my body to become my astral self. In almost an instant, I stepped through space and time to my house, climbing the stairs to our bedroom. It was just as I suspected. Mary was already in bed, and the man seated beside her, smoothing back her hair from her forehead. I feel so cold. Hold me just a minute. Please, Phil. All right. But I hope you're not going to change your mind. No. No. I won't back out now. I see that he's got to go. I didn't have to hear anymore. It was beyond revenge. It was my life or theirs. I turned to the table drawer on the opposite side of the bed, knowing they couldn't see me. I took out the revolver we kept there for household protection. And even knowing they couldn't hear me, I had to say the words, Die, die, both of you. I have no life left. Darling, can you hear me? What? What? Oh, my darling, listen to me. It's Mary. Mary? Yes, dear. It can't be. You're dead. No, no, darling. Open your eyes and look. I don't understand. I fired the shots. I saw you both fall back. The blood. The blood. Don't think of all that now. It's over. I think you'd better talk to the doctor. What doctor? My name is Dr. Egan, Mr. Solway. If you remember, we have met once. I killed you. In your mind, perhaps. Fortunately, the wish only remained father to the deed. It never actually happened. I don't understand. What did happen? Where am I? In a hospital, darling. 
How did I get here? A nice little Indian gentleman with a name I couldn't even pronounce, let alone remember, was sitting next to you on the train. When you had your seizure, he brought you here. What do you mean, seizure? You uh, went into convulsions. And if you hadn't gotten to the hospital in time, you would have been dead. I still don't understand, Phil. It, it wasn't just hypertension. No, that was a result, not a cause. But what was the cause? Well, that was the difficult thing to pin down. If the oranges had been psychiatric, I couldn't have promised you a cure, but they weren't. Almost entirely somatic. Somatic? Physical. The anorexia nervosa was the clue. Under eating. From that, here in the hospital, they managed to pin it down to hypoglycemia, lack of sugar. All the other symptoms devolved from that. Fatigue, irritation, delusions, and so on. And, and can he be cured? Of course. Once he'll cooperate. But he thought we were lovers. He thought he'd killed us. Only in the mind. And he had the total excuse that at the time he was not in his right mind. He was very ill. Don't hold it against him, Mary. I won't. If only I, I could be sure that he wants me back. In his right mind, he will. Cherish him, Mary. If he didn't feel as deeply as he does about you, he wouldn't have been ready to risk everything to make sure that no one else could have you. I do a lot of meditating these days. Oh, not the rhapsodical kind. I don't need any magic or mantras to daydream where I am with Mary. It's par for the course on the island of Maui, where the waves break on the shore, then form again to run backwards to the horizon. There's something to this traveling after all. I'm taking a long break every so often, no matter what it costs. Why didn't I find it out sooner? Object lesson for all of us. It was William Wordsworth who warned us a century and a half ago that the world is too much with us. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. George Solway was lucky. He had a fearful warning, of course, but it was enough to save the rest of his life. I'll be back shortly. The pace of life today is inexorable. We're all in danger of being driven faster than we have the physique, physical as well as mental, to ride the treadmill. What's the answer if one falters or fails? Stop the world because we want to get off? That's scarcely practical. But how about just getting off? Stop yourself and let the world go on until you're ready to catch up. Impossible? Impractical? It's an individual choice. It's a matter of what values you place upon life and the living of it. Our cast included Ralph Bell, Carol Titel, William Griffiths, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more, please subscribe to this channel. You can also visit my other YouTube channel by searching... 